Hello again, we are entering week 6 of the course and this week we are moving ahead in time taking leave from the classical period where we have explored among many things monumental Hindu Buddhist edifices through which we have thought about how ideas and art forms demonstrate a visible cultural connection between Southeast Asia and India. At the same time, as we have also gained some awareness that anything that was borrowed or adopted were often understood through local interpretive frames. So what we're going to do is to see if this also applies to the coming of Islam. Uh, as an opening image, the mosque you see on the screen is a fairly typical example of how a mosque building used to look like across the archipelagos of Southeast Asia prior to the 20th century. It is unlike the designs uh, that, uh, uh, that is more prevalent today, which normally spots an iron onion dome construct construction. So what we have here is instead a tiered roof construction with a sloping pyramidal structure crowned by an apex that makes the roof look quite distinctively large in comparison to the space that sits under it, right? So how did this form of building came to be associated with the mosque? To answer that and to explore what might be called the Islamic arts and culture in this part of the world, let's begin by painting the big picture. When it comes to Islam, uh, the sacred text of the religion called the Quran can be said to be its highest form of material expression. However, we won't be touching so much on the Quran this week and will return to explore its artistic features later on in the course when we look at concepts and ideas around picturing and pattern making. Perhaps what is important for us to note, at least for now, is that what is contained within the Quran are not just texts, nor are they just simply words, uh, but within the Abrahamic Neoplatonic metaphysics of which uh, Islam uh, uh, is in conversation with, uh, it's important to note that the word is understood as a logos. Uh, they are active agents that carry within them ideas and paradigms. In this sense, uh, they carry entire world and the possibilities of its expressions within them. Uh, thinking about it in this way allows us to entertain the idea that the coming of Islam could be thought of as bringing about a rebirth, a renaissance in the archipelago of Southeast Asia uh, through translation. And translation plays a crucial part in ushering us into a period of early modernity. Uh, so what I mean by early modernity here, it's not a fixed concept. Uh, when we use the word modernity, we associate it with concepts like newness, change, progress, uh, as opposed to something that is classical, which is enduring. By describing this period as a period of early modernity, in effect, what I'm trying to do is also speak back against a large body of colonial scholarship. They have tended to view anything that came after the monumental cultures of Angkor and Borobudur in Southeast Asia as evidences that the culture of Southeast Asia is suffering from decline and blame was directed at Islam uh, in the island part of Southeast Asia while Theravada Buddhism on some level uh, became the source of blame for mainland Southeast Asia. Let's see if we can find a different perspective. Uh, this unfortunately has survived into our common understanding of heritage where we continue to look out for monumental relics. We often take them as evidences of technological sophistication and complexity, at the same time ignoring the fact that uh, in order to construct such monumental structures, uh, what is the cost of labor 
and resources that are needed. Uh, while on the one hand, it is a demonstration of uh, the sophistication of um, human resource management on some level, at another level, we should also be asking, what is the cost of building something like this? What kind of system of oppression was needed in the society uh, in order for a king to be able to marshal uh, such a huge uh, pool of manpower to realize the construction of these huge monumental buildings. When we begin to consider uh, from this perspective, I think uh, it challenges our assumption that the absence of monumental architecture necessarily means that a society is not sophisticated. Mm. Conversely, it can also be argued that the abandonment of the monumental is perhaps a marker of modernity in and of itself. Let's see what we can learn about Islam. So one of the central tenets of Islam is the concept of Tawhid, its oneness, singularity, and universalism. Uh, in this sense, uh, there's also something much more democratic in Islam, uh, given that everyone is considered as an equal. Uh, society is not structured according to caste. So in appealing to this idea of oneness and unity, uh, Islam did not always differentiate religious from a political ideal that it professes. Of course, in reality, things are a lot more complicated than what is sketched out here under the caliphates section. Uh, you will get a taste of this later, but suffice to say that the majority of Muslims acknowledge that the caliph or the caliphate is the principal leadership institution of the ummah or the religious community. And the caliph himself, uh, uh, Khalifa itself means, uh, comes from the Arabic word that means successor or steward or deputy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so th this is a role that recognizes this, the leader of uh, Islam as the successor of uh, the messenger of God, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then, however, the studies of pre-Islamic texts itself uh, suggest the original meaning of the phrase was the successor elected by God. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, in the past, it's often used to describe uh, Arabian monarchs, uh, using very often the title Malik or King. Uh, so with the coming of Islam, the world was understood through a new geographical imagination. This imagination originates from the Persian word Zerbadat, uh, and it was used by Arab traders uh, to describe the Malay world. Uh, the term itself uh, referred specifically to the monsoonal wind that the sailing ships would rely on to carry them to Southeast Asia. Therefore, traveling in this sense was contingent on seasonal changes in the directions of wind pattern. So if the Malay world was below the winds, then the world westward would be something that was described as uh, above the winds. While connections between these two worlds were very palpable and concrete uh, because they were, the connection was realized through trade, uh, one also has to remember that the distance between the Middle East and Southeast Asia was huge and this meant that there was a lot left to the imagination uh, when it came to understanding about each other. Uh, when the land above the winds uh, were described in his, uh, Malay chronicles and texts, these territories often take on the characteristics of uh, something more paradisal, or, uh, or, or it is like uh, you know a heavenly abode, often conflated with the idea of kayangan, uh, a kind of fairy land almost. Likewise. The Arabs also had very little idea of what Southeast Asia was like. Uh, uh, an illustrated example uh, that you see here on the screen, imagine 
Sumatra and Java being populated by wing tree dwellers of Zabaj. Right. Uh, so, uh, the, so the, really the whole pattern of interaction between above and below the winds was structured according to the seasonal monsoonal cycle. So the Malay word for musim comes from the Arabic word mosim, which means season. Right? It's a period of time in which a ship could sail safely from point X to point Y. Uh, so typically, eastbound cargo ships from uh, Yemen would depart for India with the southwest monsoonal wind, which enabled them to sail all the way to China in one season, although they normally had stopovers in India. And going westbound, ships had to cover their voyage in two seasons, from China uh, down to India with the northwesterly winds uh, was uh, typically the first stage, uh, with one stop waiting for the southwest wind in mid-October uh, to rise in order to complete their voyage to Yemen or the Persian Gulf. Uh, so some uh, interesting illustrations survive in the Makamat of uh, Al-Hariri uh, from the 13th century, and it shows crew members at work uh, on what would typically be an Indian Ocean uh, trade plying ship. So the crews and passengers here, as you can see, all have quite different colors. Some of them are more light-skinned, others tend to be more dark-skinned. Uh, what this suggests is that they could be of many different ethnicity. A ship is a very cosmopolitan space, but it could also be that they were exposed to uh, the sun, uh, especially those who had to work in the upper deck. Uh, whereas in the lower deck, you have all the water bailers, uh, which was a constant problem uh, with Arab Persian ships uh, that required you to have a team of people bailing out water so that the ship doesn't sink. Uh, what you see here is that the captain is represented uh, at, uh, in the left in showing uh, in a much larger profile, uh, which suggests his authority. Uh, uh, officers here were often sort of like seamen. And what's interesting is that uh, the highest office in, in a typical ship like this would be called the Nakuda. And this is from the Persian word, uh, no being boat and ship, kuda being master. Uh, in many ways, if you know the Malay language, this has survived into the Malay language as the Nakoda. So this is a highly sophisticated and complex trading network. And this is the type of network that sustains the activity of translation that takes place over a long period of time. Yeah. And translation is key here because then cultures now are, can be thought of as something that is mobile. It is not something that is sedentary. It doesn't sort of, it's not simply located in what part of the world, but it's something that is actively on the move alongside with the people whose life is structured by the rhythm of constant movement. So to give you a sense of what this world is like, it's a huge, huge, huge world, uh, you know, stretching all the way from East Africa uh, to the south of China. And therefore, when we think of the Indian Ocean trade and how Islam played a central role in facilitating not just movement of goods, but also of ideas, I think we get a sense of where, when we think about Islamic culture and art in this part of the world, how we really have to also think of uh, how uh, Southeast Asia is not isolated from broader conversations that is going on in neighboring regions, but is a central uh, intersection uh, where ideas flow through, things are adopted, things are translated, uh, 